do it here. I know you're looking kind of at an icky fence over at an Israeli settlement, but um, you know, imagine maybe, <laughs> or kind of squeeze your view out this direction to come some of the more flatter open areas. Uh, you know the gospel story well of the birth of Jesus. Uh, Matthew speaks about um, the um, the wise men who come, the magi who come, um, and and Jesus uh, as a refugee in Egypt to escape Herod the Great. Uh, Luke speaks about the journey of well the, the the appearance of the angel Gabriel to Mary up in Nazareth. And then Mary and Joseph's journey down to Bethlehem, where she gives birth, and the shepherds coming and visiting, and, and all of this. The, the details in the Matthew and the Luke account are totally different. So together we have nice Christmas carols and, and Christmas cards, yeah, between them. Um, Mark begins with Jesus being baptized, and John begins with the creation of the world. <laughs> uh, so the two Gospels we have. Uh, there's a lot of cultural background information that we can bring to bear. Uh, a lot of it shakes stereotypical views. A lot of our views in, in America are based on New England courier and Ives drawings of sleighs and, and snow or um, our, our Christmas hymns sometimes talk about, you know, the cold winter's night that was so deep. I guess that's the snow that was deep and other things. and. And even in, even when Christmas is in places that never get snow, there's sort of that idea, you know, that that that's part of part of the deal, part of the package. Um, you know, we have an, a mean old innkeeper, yeah. Um, we have we have an animal full of a stable full of animals, off back somewhere, and we have shepherds show up that same night in the. And the guys that on the camels right behind them, yeah? You know, these things you have. You have. And I, I, there's no reason to tip over any of that because it's, it's part of who we are. And uh, you could say it's as good a guess as any, right? Um, but when we do look at cultural backgrounds, at, at language in the text, both the Gospels and other ancient texts, when we look at archaeology, a bit when we uh, when we consider the the traditional ways of life of traditional people in this land villagers who kept just kept doing stuff the same way they always have uh, you might have some other other um, suggestions perhaps as to what it's like um, want to mention three things and if I don't mind moving after the first one to catch some sunlight all right but move around keep that blood going right uh, <coughs> Mary, number one. Um, I want to say something about the, um, um, uh, the like the location, um, uh, you know, where the manger might have been, where the where the stable. Something about the stable, and then something about the shepherds. Yeah, that's probably enough. First of all, Mary. You know these things that you've heard probably about her being quite young. Probably are accurate. Um, the, we have a lot of language about, about women written by men. Um, a lot of it's sexist, a lot of it's utilitarian. Um, the history of the Middle East has never been kind to women. Uh, it still isn't. Um, I, but I'll balance that with when done holistically in small villages, in a family context, the woman's role to provide and protect for her family was extremely functional and valuable. The man also provided and protected for his family. They had different things they did, but it was the woman's responsibility, task, role that I think was even more critical uh, in terms of providing the daily bread, in terms of uh, rationing the daily resources, in terms of inculcating the values to her children. Let's call it homeland security, yeah? That she was able to do, that the guys were a little bit clueless about. Um, and we'll touch some of that in Galilee when, when uh, um, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law 
immediately she gets up and waits on them, um, which means she has regained her role as a provider and protector for her family, uh, which gives absolute fulfillment uh, for her. Um, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. We do have stories about women who got married later in life. Um, usually these tend to be the women who are a little better off, wealthier, uh, traveling a bit, you know, the queens and things. Uh, we can't use them as the standard template for what village women did, even though we have more stories about them. Uh, and the, the, the deal was, um, you know, people don't live very long. Average life expectancy is in 30s probably, mid 30s, maybe late 30s. Uh, that would pretty near pick up almost everybody here, wouldn't it? <laughs> um, and twice. And, twice. <laughs> and, and the number one cause of death, childbirth, among women, still is many places in the world today. Um, and so you want to, and, and, and the value of having children, multiple, fa family and land, two biggest values by far in the ancient world, family and land, ancestral land, descendants, and ancestors is changed. And so you want as many as you can, and, and if the lady can be, the younger she is, let's say, as long as she's you know, physically able to have children, um, you know, the younger the stronger, and the more possible, right? If you wait until you're 20 or 25, that's like grandma age almost, you know, equivalent to that. The idea that, that you want to have a woman married before she can then be illicit with somebody else and then be stigmatized for the rest of her life as well so you grab her while she's young that's part of it too it's a bit sexist but it's part of it too. you just have to face the facts we don't gain anything by changing the data as to the way people talk you have to kind of look at it um, that the guy is older that's probably part of it as well um, there's a Catholic idea early church fathers that said Joseph was an already widowed, older, itinerant carpenter. Mary was a ward of the temple in Jerusalem. Mary born in Jerusalem, um, north of the Temple Mount area. And she was given over by her parents to be a, a virgin in the temple for her whole life. And this older, widowed, already with children, itinerant carpenter needed a wife and the Jewish priests did matchmaking, right? And, uh, and Mary then was attached to him um, for care and protection, but not for children. Hence, a perpetual virgin. Right? And Jesus then still having brothers. This is a, a, a pretty common idea. Again, I don't want to tip on it, but I, I don't know that we have to have that as an idea. Um, um, I don't know the age gap between them. When we get up to Nazareth, we'll talk about why they're even there to begin with in Nazareth. That's a long way from here. Their, their family is Bethlehem. They're of the house and lineage of David. Both of them seem to be. Um, Mary has a kinswoman living in Judea, Elizabeth. A kinswoman, although. Her family is down here as well. His family is down here. This is why they come down here to be enrolled when they're taxed. Mary's kinswoman, Elizabeth, is married to a priest, John. Uh, Zachariah, rather, the parents of John the Baptist, who was to be a priest as well. Does that mean that Mary has priestly blood? Priests tended to marry priesthood, or equal caste, you might say. Does that mean that she comes from some means, perhaps? Chose to leave it to go to Nazareth? Possible. It's also possible that Mary and Joseph were, were distant cousins. Very possible that you marry with and you strengthen your family unit by marry, by keeping the resources close to home. It's called endogamous, the anthropologists call it, where you marry tight. First cousins, our assistant cook on campus, he's, his wife, a, 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 a secretary at the Bible College, she's a believer, he, as far as we can tell, first cousins. They have a, a boy, Michelle. The grandparents were very worried Michelle would be bit too genetically you know close but he worked out still happens to keep the resources close provision and protection and so I think the pictures we have of her being quite young 
are correct. If we take Luke's narrative line that she comes down here to visit Elizabeth, when she's already pregnant, the journey from Galilee is going to be maybe a week, maybe pushing a week. She's not going to go alone. Uh, the women of the street go out alone. Mary is not that type of person. She's got to have somebody going with her. The gospel is silent on who it is. When she gets back to Nazareth, Matthew has the line, and it was found that she was with child. I want to know what's behind that line. Who knew first? You know? And uh, those of you who have been, or have children or sisters or whatever who have been pregnant, you know. Uh, maybe before other people who don't know. No. Yeah? At my, our pastor, when Diane had a, was pregnant with her first, said, you have a lovely motherly countenance. I don't know what that meant, but I guess he was trying to be kind <laughs> to her when she was there, you know, just got her on what she was. But you know, baggy clothes and all. I mean, you're going to find out. Nazareth, a small town. And everybody in town assumes the obvious. And who got her while she was going to Bethlehem and back, perhaps? Or what crowd was she running in when she was gone those months? Or, come on, Joseph. You know, you know, you know it's like the dog ate my homework. Come on. An angel talked to you? I mean, come on. <laughs> you know, most of the people in town, right? You can imagine. And so it's very convenient for them to come down here for the birth where people don't know. And maybe they can be absorbed back into real families. 